Hey, this is Wally, and you're listening to the Young Justice Files on the Whelmed podcast, or whatever. Whelmed? Dick, did you make him say that? Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Nicole Debuk, 0, 0, 6. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome the amazing Nicole Dubuque. Nicole has been working in television since she was a kid and has done jobs both in front of and behind the camera, including writing, acting, and producing. She's an eight-time Emmy-nominated writer, as well as a Writers Guild of America award winner. And her impressive writing resume includes credits for some of your favorite cartoons, including Kim Possible, Witch, Star Wars Rebels, My Little Pony French Biz Magic, and at least four different Transformers animated series. But for our listeners, she is probably best known for her work on Young Justice, where she's written some fan favorite episodes, including Bereft, Image, and Failsafe. Nicole, I am so excited to welcome you to Wound. And I am thrilled to be here. Um, I don't know if you can hear it over the, the radio here, but I'm blushing. So <laughs> thank you for the great video. <laughs> Well, we always we like to hype up our guests because everybody's awesome and they do so many cool things and we want them to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons so far, the comics and the video game. So if you have not seen, read or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. We may also touch on some other cool stuff Nicole has written. So, you know, just be aware of that in case you're trying to avoid Kim Possible spoilers or something like that. <laughs> so with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Sure thing. Um, I am a writer, sometimes a story editor, sometimes an executive producer, I was looking back through my emails in preparation. I told you this a little before, just to be ready to discuss everything. And I realized that I first met Greg Weissman 20 years ago, and I've known him, been working with him for 17 years. So wow. yes, many cartoons with Greg, um, all kinds of different shows, comedy, action, preschool, you name it. I guess what you need to know about me is that when I write something, I am most interested in the character because I feel like that informs everything. So I try to approach all of my storytelling character first. Nice. So branching off of that, uh, branching off of knowing Greg Weissman for 20 years, <laughs> what is your origin story? What inspired you to pursue a career in entertainment? And how did you become a screenwriter for animation? Sure thing. Well, um, I didn't actually intend this route when I started out. <laughs> I didn't even think of writing per se. I, I started out, as you you mentioned before, I was a, a child actress and I did that from three to 14. And around that time I was like, okay, I'm ready for the normal high school experience. So I kind of put that to sleep, but I still had that bug of working in entertainment and I wanted to create and make movies. And at the time, I think I wanted to be a director. That was my main focus. So I'd rope my friends into making small films. Uh, I went to film camp over the summers. And then when it was time to go to college, my parents said, yeah, but you're not actually going to film school. <laughs> you can do that in grad school. Let's just get a regular undergrad degree. And, and uh, at that time, I was thinking I might be a doctor. So kind of pre-med biology focused. So I went to college and uh, I went through all the pre-med courses, but I discovered that English was just so much easier and more, um, I wouldn't say interesting because biology was fantastic and I loved it, but it just, I guess it was easier. Uh, and I discovered that I was doing really well in writing and hadn't considered that as a career until I did an internship in my junior year at college. And I worked for Disney online. I've always been a huge animation nut. So that was basically a dream come true, getting to write for these characters and um, kind of seeing behind the scenes how scripts are written. And I made a lot of friends there in the industry. So when I graduated school, I reached out to those contacts because, you know, what I was an English major when I graduated, but then I decided I was not going to be a doctor and was like, okay, what now? <laughs> and a lot of my friends from Disney Online had actually moved to a company in San Francisco. It was kind of the boom and bust startup time. So this company, UBUBU, 
uh, was just starting up and they said, yeah, you can come and join us here and, and write some content uh, for our, our company. And uh, through that process, which was about seven months long before the company went belly up, because we were all kind of doing that at that time, it was Pink Slip Party Central in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, I made a lot of friends that had come from Disney Animation and um, spoke to them about their experience. And uh, something that kept coming up, they would say, well, you really have the sense of humor to write animation. And, you know, the place for those puns is on the page. <laughs> So uh, I took that to heart and I watched a lot of cartoons. I started, I'd go back to my apartment every night and watch cartoons and break down the storytelling. So I spent a lot of time watching Disney's Hercules, uh, Gargoyles, which I got the, the VHS, horribly recorded VHS <laughs> from Craigslist. Um, <laughs> so watched all of those again and uh, it just kind of started writing in my spare time. And after that, I moved back to Los Angeles and made some contacts again through those friends from um, originally my internship and uh, met with some people at Disney. And Jay Fukuto is the person who actually got me started uh, really meeting people. And he had me meet with these two showrunners who had just launched a show. And they said, hey, here's the Bible. We don't have any slots left for this season. But if we get picked up, you know, why don't you take your hand at writing an episode and we'll, we'll see if we like it. So I spent the next year. I moved back home with my parents. I just wrote for myself. I went to the Writers Guild and did as much research on writing as I could. I wrote a bunch of spec scripts, um, you know, scripts that nobody has actually bought, but you're writing them to kind of show who you are on the page. I wrote a Gilmore Girls. I wrote a CSI and I wrote a spec for this animated show, which was Kim Possible. And as it turned out, they did get a second season. And Mark and Bob, the producers, hired me to be an apprentice staff writer and actually made the episode I wrote as a spec. So that was an incredible stroke of luck. I am so grateful to them. And that was my my entree, I guess, into the industry there, the animation side. That's so cool. No, that's just, that's so cool. And just the idea of how your journey through this is a fascinating little ride. I don't, when you've talked to other writers on this, I'm sure they all have different bizarre stories. No one yeah. has the same story, right? No. Yeah. It's so cool. Everyone from the cast and crew has a very different, very different journey from how they have gotten into this particular little niche of, of making entertainment. It's very cool. But along those lines, what was your history with DC and with comics in general before starting work on Young Justice? I would say that my experience with DC was actually through animation. So I watched cartoons always. And I was a big fan of the Batman Superman hour, which happened to fall right the hour right before the dining hall opened in college. So <laughs> I finished class, I'd come back, I'd watch an hour of this. And, um, and then I, I watched Justice League after that, uh, Justice League Unlimited. And that was really how I started to learn the mythos of these characters. And then after that, I came to comics. And um, my boyfriend at the time, his name is Ian, and he's friends with Greg. He actually was like computer consult for Greg for a long time <laughs> because he's, he's a Mac guy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Ian had an extensive collection of comics, which was super helpful because I think the first comic property I worked on was Spectacular Spider-Man. And whatever issue I needed pulled, Ian was right there like, oh, here, I'll just pull out this box. That was kind of my, my experience there and the chance to learn on the job which again, I had an idea of a lot of the mythos. Like I also watched X-Men, X-Men Evolution, yes. you know, Marvel and DC. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, it's great when you can do for fun what you, what you did for fun for your job. Yes. I have another random thing. I know I'm off tracking us for a moment, but to the point of how everyone gets in this industry. Yeah. So you may have read this. I think Greg wrote this on Twitter, but Zara and I actually met Greg at a gathering gargoyles convention yeah. in 2001 and we were both cast in the same radio play yeah which yes. just it's hilarious to me <laughs> that that was where all of this came together then later on we would all work on young justice together it's just it's such a small bizarre world <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing so usually we ask our guests when they first saw young justice but that doesn't seem like quite the right question for you <laughs> So instead, how did you end up working on Young Justice all the way back in season one? 
you're saying, well, come back in time with me to yes. September 2009. Yes. <laughs> when I get an email uh, from Greg that he had this show that he had uh, developed that might go, but it hadn't gotten a green light yet, but it had gotten kind of the writing go ahead for the first few episodes. So was I interested to come in? And of course, whenever Greg calls, the answer is yes. I will follow this man to battle. Um, <laughs> and so we all met um, at the Warner Brothers lot in his office there. And that's when I met Brandon as well and uh, started breaking the first stories. So I was there from the from the jump pretty much, oh. um, obviously not for the development, but um, it was really fun. I just remember, I feel like I was sitting on the floor. I'm, I don't know if we just, it was just too small of an office or we didn't have chairs, but <laughs> sitting on the floor, leaning up against the wall, starting to break these stories. And it, those story breaks are so fun. Uh, it was It was just an absolute blast. That is so cool. Uh, <laughs> and you're also <laughs> occasionally an actress, as we've touched on. So on Young Justice, you voice Iris West Allen, which some people might not know. But is there a story behind how you went from writing for Young Justice to also playing one of these characters? Yeah, I actually I, I really wanted to get back into acting a little bit. And, um, you know, Greg knew I was an actress, which will become important later. And we start talking about episode selection. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I asked him, I said, hey, can I audition? You know, I'd, I'd love to do I, There's so many roles on this show. You know, maybe I could just do a small part. And so he said, sure thing. So he sent me some sides occasionally for characters. And so I'd read and then I ended up landing on Iris. So, yeah, I just would, I would send him auditions. And I think he's used to getting <laughs> random voice memos from me because I actually <laughs> sang him the Hello, Megan theme song of what my idea for it was. Too. Oh, that is so amazing. <laughs> Yeah, there's plenty of embarrassing, uh, embarrassing stuff that I've <laughs> got there. Uh, so yeah, no, that now that makes me curious. Did you write the lyrics for the Hello Megan theme song when that episode came along? Yeah. Greg and I collaborated on the lyrics. Yeah, that is amazing. Because <laughs> I know that was one that I was never sure. I was like, well, did the composers write this or did? But but that is amazing. <laughs> Super fun. Actually, I have my Hello Megan shirt on. I made these for the crew. And on the back, it says crew 1979, 1980. Um, and I, I tried to get the actual art, um, but they wouldn't let it out of production yet. They're like, no, it hasn't aired. You can't, you can't have this asset. Like, oh, God, I really wanted to have actual crew shirts for this fake show. That'd be great. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> I, I actually, I remember like Greg wore that to, to a con a couple of times. So there are like specific interview clips from like way back in 2011 of Greg wearing that shirt and people being like, is this, what is, what is this? We have questions. Mystery. Yeah. I love wearing this shirt too, because someone will always come up to me and say, hello, Megan. Like, <laughs> just, like, no, no, there's fun. context. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not smacking your forehead. I'm not responding. Um. <laughs> so you have written for a lot of animated shows, as we have talked about. Seriously, for any, just go look at Nicole's resume. For anyone who thinks that I touched on everything in our intro, it is not. There is a very long list, and I had to pick a few. Um, so, what does the writer's room experience for Young Justice look like? And what is it like in comparison to some of the other shows that you've worked on? Sure. Yeah. Starting out with the, the Young Justice writer's room, and it has evolved over the seasons. But in that first season, when we started out, we'd get together and we'd talk through a block of episodes. I'd say like five to seven, maybe. Maybe seven's too many. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe it was just five. We get in the room and basically there would be like general story pitches that Brandon and Greg had worked out. And the whole room would talk through each of these stories. And I think we the rooms lasted maybe two to three days and we'd take a break for lunch um, in between. We Which worked the same way when I worked with him on that. And Greg would be jotting down everything on the proper index card and putting it up on that wall of index cards. I know you've seen pictures of <laughs> the, uh, the incredibly detailed, amazing wall. So we'd kind of just beat out in general or talk about each episode and what we were setting up for future episodes and what needed to be dug in on. And everyone would kind of be pitching cool ideas. Then after we discussed through, we'd start assigning episodes. And that was usually this process of you'd raise your hand if you liked an episode <laughs> and then a little bit of negotiation as to who took what. I remember one time it was somebody was trying to get me to swap and I'm like, nope, nope, sorry, nope. I really <laughs> apologize. No. Uh, 
And then at that point, once we kind of worked out that idea um, from the premise that they already had, the writers would branch off and do a beat sheet. And then also, I remember in the first few episodes, we were writing also the character arc for each episode. And then once that got approved, you were to outline and then to script. Um, and we'd come in and do these blocks, I think maybe three times a season of these of these writers' rooms. And that is actually pretty unique, I think. Um, certainly the, the the way that Greg plots is unique to anybody else in the industry I've worked with. Um, it is incredible. It is such a gift. I wish I had it. It fries <laughs> my brain to think about. But now, nowadays, like you'll have a writer's room where you're on staff. And that means, you know, some, some rooms are all day. You're just in there working through. Uh, some rooms meet a couple hours a day. Some rooms only meet once a week. So it, it all really depends on the show. Or sometimes you'll just bring in the writer and do a story break with them for that specific episode. That's usually, that's what we did on My Little Pony, usually on a show that has a story editor, but not a writing staff. You'll bring in your freelancer and just do kind of a mini room. So, yeah. Yeah. And then from there, you go off and perform wizardly magic uh, and create an episode. <laughs> it just springs fully formed into the world. <laughs> Everyone, Athena. <laughs> <laughs> so speak speaking of all of this, attentive viewers may notice that a lot of your episodes are focused on my favorite character, Miss Martian. And I had a question about that that ended up actually being echoed by one of our Patreon supporters when we announced this interview, which was our patron, uh, Parker Brown, was curious about this and asked, what is the process for deciding who writes which episodes, which we just talked about? And is there a reason a lot of your episodes are typically more focused on Miss Martian? Sure thing. So yes, so there was originally just that everyone's kind of like, okay, who gets what? But then you start to get into kind of a, a circle of writing where, you know, you don't want to get an episode that's right up next to your other episodes. So you start to kind of fall into a placement in these blocks. And I think in the back of Greg's mind, part of the reason why I get associated with Miss Martian is because I used to be an actress. And that was really obviously clear later on in Image, right? Um, when that becomes kind of an issue. He was so thrilled about that uh, because he's like, we have we have a child actress who's playing an actress and we have a child actress who wrote it. This is perfect. So yeah, I think that Greg did start to just say, okay, I'm I'm steering you more toward these Miss Martian milestone episodes, which I loved and because it it helped me track a character's arc. So it was kind of a gift in that regard. And I started to feel proprietary toward Miss Martian, <laughs> or at least, you know, a love, you know, and, and also the super boy of it all too, I think. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> Every, everyone who listens <laughs> knows that I love Miss Martian and I love Superboy and Miss Martian together. So hearing that, I'm just like, yes, thank you. Thank you for this gift that I was given in the show. <laughs> So as, as you just mentioned, you grew up working on sitcoms uh, as a kid on Major Dad and Our House. Uh, so how did those experiences influence your writing for episodes like Image that really draw on a lot of Miss Martian's love for a specific classic sitcom? Well, in some ways, it was actually kind of cathartic a little bit. Um, there's one line specifically. I pulled up this script because I wanted to look at the actual line. And it's uh, Marie is talking to Miss Martian and is like, listen, hello, Megan was a job. The person you saw on TV isn't who I am. And that was me basically boiling down a lot of my experience growing up because I would have kids in middle school say, you know, how is it like having Gerald McCraney as your dad? And it's like, no, but he's not really my dad. Like, you know, these things didn't actually happen to me. Like, oh my gosh. So separating that acting life there's another line in here too, I think, where Marie's like, yeah, being Megan, it was, it, or being, it was fun. That's, that's all, you know, it was a job. And I feel like I said that a lot too. People be like, wow, what's it like? And it's like, well, you know, some kids do soccer after school. Some kids go on auditions. And uh, so it was, this was a kind of a great experience for me to just speak my truth, I guess, about how that was. Yeah. And so it, yeah, it works. That episode feels very honest. And it's like one of those things where the more you dig into it, the more meta levels are revealed. You're like, oh, this this is a very good, well put together episode for all of these reasons. Um, totally. And I will say, like, when we were watching WandaVision. Greg and I were writing to each other. <laughs> Hello, Megan. <laughs> so, yes. No, deeply loved WandaVision in this house. So that is amazing. <laughs> That's that's how I that's how I trick everyone into letting me do a WandaVision episode on Whelmed. I'll just find a way. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. Similar connection. 
And so with all of this, I know we we kind of touched on it, but I wanted to talk about it just a little bit more. You were saying that after a while, Greg uh, started kind of assigning you to the Miss Martian episodes a little bit more. But did you initially gravitate towards her? And if so, why? Was there anything behind that to initially picking out those episodes, raising your hand and going, I want to do that one? Yeah, I'm trying to think. And um, what is the first... Is Bereft the first one I wrote? Do you remember? Again, I, apologies to everyone listening. It has been 12 years and I have a lot of stuff in my brain that's like <laughs> other fiction at this point. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to apologize to that. My brain is saying yes, because uh, I think, yes, I believe, because Bereft is the ninth or 10th episode. So it's pretty early on. And I think that was the first one that they had you on for that. If I'm remembering I'm correctly, it has been a long time since I've done a full rewatch of season one, so I may be wrong, but. Well, I, I, the first episode, I think I chose the first episode just because it seemed interesting to me. Um, I don't know that originally, at that point, we were learning all the characters. Yeah. So, you know, the characters exist, obviously, in comics and in other incarnations, but in each show, you're kind of tailoring it toward the voice of what this show is. Yeah. And, uh. So yeah, I think no school. That's the first one. School. Oh. I knew there was a, another one. Okay. Gosh, my brain. Uh, uh. No, we're this together. So pretend that never happened. And when I wrote school, <laughs> but when I, when I wrote schooled, I think it was just a matter of you know we're assigned Andrew, uh, Kevin, Nicole. You're each taking one here. Go. And so it was just getting the voices of the characters in my head. And I do remember wanting to write Bereft, but I couldn't tell you why I was attracted to it specifically then. I think it might have been the character journey you get to do because there's that fun reboot for everyone yeah. briefly. I'm going to sidebar a little bit here to talk about. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic a bit, but go for it. Um, when I went back and looked at Bereft, I noticed a conversation Greg and I had about Martian and the language Martian. And he asked me how I had come up with this way of writing Martian. Um, and I, I kind of flippantly wrote back, I minored in Martian at Yale. But, um, no, but what I explained to him was that um, I couldn't find if it had been quantified on the internet. I did a search to see if there was a DC specific Martian language. Yeah. And so I just kind of riffed on the Martian names I knew, like Mars, you know, um, with the apostrophe. Yeah. And, um, and then I thought about the fact that most negatives in languages have an N. So I would add an N to something to make it a negative. And then I tried to match the word count for what the, you know, the words would be in the sentence. And then I used personal modifiers that I created with an apostrophe. So I created this Martian language, <laughs> which got me in trouble later, right? Because then I had to like work on Ranian, which is a whole other conversation we can have. But, um, and I had originally excised all the vowels because I was treating it like hieroglyphics. And so Greg wrote back and is like, I'm going to roll with this, but I'm putting in some vowels because <laughs> the names have vowels. I'm like, okay. So, uh, yeah. So that was kind of my first foray into Young Justice linguistics territory, which oh, was a trend that was to continue throughout. That is amazing. Um, I'd even <laughs> forgotten. Like, I was like, oh, right. Miss Martian does speak in Martian for a little bit of that episode before she remembers English. And it is, and it just feels so natural that I think my brain just kind of forgot about it for a second there. It's like, yeah, no, this is just a language. Nobody had to invent that. That's just there. Right. That's one of my favorite things about working with Greg is that, you know, you get challenged in these ways you wouldn't expect. And it's it's terrifying and fun, you know, like in the spectacular Spider-Man episode where I had to do all of the Shakespearean quotes and then I had to reference them. It was great. It was like a college course again. So, yes, yeah. just take down Very the fast. big complete works and just start flipping through to find what you need. Yep. Went to the concordance, picking out words to search for is all good. <laughs> there is a Shakespeare quote for everything. You just have to find it. <laughs> so uh, going on to a, a different one of your episodes, Failsafe remains one of kind of the most memorable episodes of Young Justice. I hear people bring it up all the time. And unlike a lot of other dream sequence episodes for other shows, Failsafe feels like it carries a lot of weight with character development and consequences that could have easily in any other property just not felt like they were there. Uh, so how did you approach that story that is so complex and so connected to everything else? Did 
Greg and Brandon have like a lot of influence over that narrative or were you kind of given more freedom as long as it was kind of within the bounds of it's a mental training sequence and everybody dies? Well, uh, first I have to give credit to Brandon for coming up with the premise of that episode. And it, it's, it was kind of a, an emotional roller coaster to write as well. And I'm very glad that I've passed along the trauma. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm glad that everyone had that same resonant experience um, that I did when I was writing it, because honestly, I was typing stuff and going, oh my God, I just, I just crushed Smallville, <laughs> you know, like all this power. Ah. But I remember in the room, it was just originally the story was, it was just going to be like a Kobayashi Maru. And yeah. it was only going to be just to prove, you know, you're going to face defeat as a team and you have to have resilience. And I was adamant when we were breaking it that there had to be stakes because I think we all hate as viewers to have, it was just a dream episode. Yeah. And if we're going to do these serious things and make our viewers feel, we don't want it to feel hollow at the end or feel tricked, non-satisfying. Yeah. And so that's yeah. when um, we started discussing what that possibility could be and landed on, look, Miss Martian could have killed everyone. And what does that mean for her to know that she has that ability and then also almost did this without thinking or from a, from a place of care? And one of the greatest things, I think, and I'm sorry, I keep giving all of this praise to Greg. I feel like I do this every time I talk about him. <laughs> sorry, Greg, your ears are burning. Is that things, things that happen in episodes have consequences. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even see where that's going to lead. And so it was very nice to be able to kind of draw out the consequences of this episode through the rest of the season and beyond. You know, one thing that came up, I, I, I jotted a note here that David Reed is in fail safe and you don't know that nobody calls him out by name, but Greg knows that. And he seated that character there. So later on we could pay off and he's always looking to do that. And um, again, fail safe, perfect place to set up, to tee up so many things. Yeah, I had I had some freedom on that, you know, working from the premise, went to a beat sheet next. Um, certainly always collaborative effort and back and forth with the room and then also with, with and uh, of course, they always elevate it when they take it over um, and as it goes through each step of the process. But I remember that one, you know, you almost felt exhausted after writing it because it was it was so emotionally intense. And another fun sidebar on that. So because we were in Central City, which is essentially St. Louis, and that's where my husband is from, I had a really fun time destroying the arch. <laughs> that was uh, kind of a kind of a little inside little note there to my husband, Brian. <laughs> so Very fun. Very fun. Because I feel like an episode like that, even knowing that there will be consequences and everything, there is so much freedom in going, I can do the big world ending thing in this episode uh and it will get erased there will be emotional consequences but i can destroy smallville and no one can stop me <laughs> right, right i just remember like i just killed wonder woman what am i doing <laughs> um yeah. and with that were those or some of those things was destroying smallville and stuff like that were those things that you knew you wanted to like tackle in that episode from the beginning or were there kind of things that you discovered along with those themes and just think all of the great little moments in that episode that you kind of discovered as you went or did you have them in mind from the beginning of like oh this this needs to happen kind of thing i think when we were talking about this episode we wanted to focus on what are some of the most iconic things in dc you know to, to show how deep and widespread this alien invasion was going to be and to really try to hit everybody in the fields. And so we discussed a lot of that and usually, usually we work the themes out pretty well before putting pen to paper or I guess hitting keys with fingers. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we discussed a lot of this, but some of it does come out as you're working through. And sometimes it's just, you have a character tell you something and it sounds really bizarre when you say it like this, but there's they, these characters sit in your brain and they tell you how they would react in a situation and you write down their dialogue. And sometimes that will make the writer stop and say, Oh my gosh, I had never thought about that. Let's track that through and see where that goes. And did you, did you have one of those for fail safe or just kind of the general vibe of it? Of everything that I happens. believe I did. I believe well, I, I just remember the experience of writing that being 
so all encompassing and, and really emotional that I know that I was doing some discovery there. Yeah. Um, I couldn't yeah. pinpoint it because I don't keep a journal, but I do keep my email. So if it's <laughs> in an email, then generally I can source it back to you, but I didn't, I didn't write anything down specifically about that, but no worries. these no worries. episodes, Okay. Thanks for rolling with me. Yeah. No, the, the young justice episodes, I think they always, they're so, um, so detailed. There's so much arcing you have to do in the show. Uh, you take longer on these scripts and you live with them for a long time. So there's time yeah. for that discovery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also had a couple of more questions from our wonderful Patreon supporters who were very excited for all this. One of our patrons, Richard Kreutz Landry had asked how much briefing do you get on the individual voices of characters when you're initially brought on to a project? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll speak just using Young Justice as an example. I mean, in this case, right, we, we talked about a little bit how the characters do exist, but to get kind of the idea of how they're going to sound in this uh, show, usually the pilot episode is written first. And also you get a Bible, which walks you through the basics of who these characters are, what their quirks are, maybe even some sample dialogue in there for you. And so what you're doing is you're reading those things and uh, learning the voices that way. And then usually your first script will kind of be your warm up where you're taking a stab at writing in these voices. And voices evolve even over time. You'll find that uh, when you cast the voice actor and start to hear them, then you'll start to write toward them as well, especially if they ad lib or have any quirky things they do that becomes part of the character and they build the character with you. Or if there isn't a joke that someone writes in a script that becomes a running gag, you know, we'll all start riffing on each other's uh, writing for these characters. So yeah, normally you have kind of those guideposts going in for what the character's voice is, and then it just continues to evolve. Yeah. Also from Richard, do you typically work on a single property or show at a time, or are you juggling a ton of different projects uh, in multiple settings all at once and keeping them all uh, in, on track in your brain? <laughs> I'm almost always working on more than one project at once, and sometimes that can be useful. You just have to make sure that you don't cross the preschool one with the adult one, because <laughs> that, that just messes everything up. But I like to say some days you feel like hugs and some days you just want to blow stuff up. That's also useful to have different projects <laughs> at the same time, yes. um, because there's a, a certain sweetness that you really enjoy in a preschool episode. And then sometimes you just want to have like a, an intense action sequence. So, yeah. It's uh, it's getting harder to keep track of them. Like as I as I referenced earlier, there's there's so much fictional history in my head at this point. <laughs> um, I feel like <laughs> trying to keep those worlds separate. You know, it's getting harder. The other day, someone brought up Witch, and I had to think for a moment. Like, oh, Heart of Kandrakar. Okay, wait. <laughs> it's like accessing this archive file in the back of my brain. But uh, just having yeah. to go through all of the filing cabinets, like I know it's here somewhere. I definitely wrote yes. it. It's somewhere. <laughs> There's dirt, there's cobwebs, some of them are zip files. I don't know. <laughs> I get that. Uh, Richard, also, final question from Richard was that in an interview at one point, Greg and Brandon mentioned that uh, there are sometimes constraints on settings or time of day and things like that in scenes in animation because of budget constraints in the idea of trying to animate entirely new settings or uh, having to give them different lighting and color palettes. So he was curious, what are some of the similarities or differences in constraints for writing for animated shows versus writing for non-animated shows, which you have also done? Because <laughs> Nicole Dubuque has yeah. done everything. <laughs> it's funny. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is on one of my live action shows, which is what we in animation call just regular television. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had written this uh, whole act that took place on a train and the action sequence was on the train and there were a lot of jokes about the train. And then I found out about... I don't know, a week and a half before shooting, guess what? We don't have the train anymore. <laughs> it's a boat now. <laughs> so suddenly there's this massive scramble rewrite to come up with action that will now work on a boat and puns that are boat related, nautical puns, um, humor, and still somehow stitching it into the existing um, script. So definitely something that doesn't come up in animation. Usually we'll catch those kind of changes early on. You're not usually having to to change an entire sequence 
you know, from the record draft, for instance. Sorry, someone um, drew a boat instead of a train and we have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, there's certainly things that come up in animation, too, where it's like, well, guess what? You know, we're only budgeted for 12 voices for this episode. You wrote 15. So taking away some of that dialogue from that character, who else can say it? You know, try to think of other examples here. I don't know. I guess one of the other things that you're up against a lot of the time is page count, which is something that comes up. I almost always write my scripts long for Greg. Uh, it's kind of a running gag at this point between us. But uh, so, yeah, so it's a matter of you don't want to write more than the board artists need to do because then you're wasting their time and they're doing extra work that's just going to get cut. So you really have to be conscious of that on the page. I would say maybe a, a slightly bit more than in live action because you're getting your coverage in live action and there will be an edit later. It certainly costs money and extra days to shoot footage you're not going to use. I'm not saying that, but I feel like possibly 30 seconds longer in a live action scene versus 30 seconds longer in an animated scene is a big budget difference. Out of curiosity from that, and if you don't have an answer to that, this this is totally fine. Can you think of anything where you ever had like a deleted scene that you had written and then had to cut or wanted to write and then had to cut from something? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I have tons of deleted scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I try to keep them in this magic file for, you know, if it doesn't work on a show that I'm freelancing on, really, but for shows that I run or story edit, I try to keep them like gags I have to cut or scenes to see if I can reuse them later, because sometimes you lose a lot of stuff you love because you have to get that page countdown. But certainly there could be at least another episode of Young Justice, I have no doubt, all from only my deleted pages. Now, it wouldn't make any sense. It would be kind of the anthology. But, it's just cutting um, between random things at random times yeah. across the seven years of the show. <laughs> exactly. It's like, Robin's like, why is there a duck on my head? And then it just goes to an action sequence. I don't know. Um, I'd watch but, that, uh, though. I would watch that. <laughs> no, I, I I definitely think there's there's so much. Um, and what's great is that I think that Greg probably has the bandwidth to not lose track of any of that, too. And he's probably doing the same thing of, like, keeping a file for ideas that had to get cut or lines to bring back later. I do think it's really cool to hear that you keep all of those, just save them. They're like, there will, there might be space for this someday. And sometimes there is, clearly. Right, right. Oh, that's fantastic. No, oh, it's it's just so cool. All of this is so cool. I We had one more question sure. that got sent in on Patreon a little late, and I wasn't sure if we were going to have time to do it, but I will grab it right now because... It seems like we're not, we're not at quite an hour yet, so we still have a little bit of time. So I'm going to just real quick pull that up if my internet will let me and ask you that question. To fill some time, I can tell you a little bit about Ranian. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to tell us more about Ranian, I will hear it. I will excitedly hear it. Okay, well, uh, so I believe it's season, season two, right? That's when we go to Ran. And... I had a lot of lines in Iranian. <laughs> Problem is, we didn't really know what the language was. And uh, so Greg said, well, why don't you check out, you know, some of Alan Moore's stuff that he's done and, and see if you can figure it out because the language is there in the comics. And so what I did was I went through the comic panels and I tried to see what the characters might be seeing, ba saying based on the expressions in the panels. And some words I was able to cross-reference with uh, someone who had done a little bit of work on this online. And so with those pieces, I Rosetta Stoned it a little bit and figured out like, oh, this modifier makes it plural. Oh, this modifier neg makes it negative. And put together basically my Ranian language to the point where Greg would write to me and say, I need a way to say this. And I would <laughs> approximate the best I could. So for instance, like I pulled up this email. Let's see. He he wanted the line. We cannot allow the stranger to escape. Keep searching. And the best translation back to English that I could come up with was the not Ranian may not travel here. Look greatly. <laughs> so it's really, really kind of sketchy, <laughs> but you know, it works. It works. And then like, works. don't, move. it works. Don't move is another one. So Ku Fao Thumsal literally means you do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no no direct translations we're going we're going with the general feel only 
exactly, exactly. Maybe there's an emotional component to the language as well that just doesn't translate. Yeah. Um, and it, so. it, I always feel like that kind of thing works so much better in visual mediums than like, you can't do that with a language in a book. Like a novel series is like, no, I have to figure out how everything works and it's, you got to have a dictionary and all of that stuff. Whereas I feel like animation and uh, live action, you can kind of just be like, it's never going to be written down and no one's ever going to try it to figure out how this all works. So it'll work the way I say it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing was, you know, whenever you're writing in a foreign language on a Greg show, you have to put what the translation is. And <laughs> so it makes you do that extra step. But I, again, it was just a great challenge and a lot of fun. I was actually finally able to pull up this question because I also had it in an email. So one more Patreon question that we had from uh, one of our other patrons was when you write an episode with a character's first appearance, you're probably trying to set kind of a tone for that character's personality and mindset and characteristics. So how do you pitch any sort of changes that you want to make to that character to make them different from previous incarnations of the character for things like Young Justice that are drawing on so much DC history, but at the same time have, you know, changed characters up and giving them a new approach to whatever it may be. Sure. Um, I think, in a, in especially in a group show like Young Justice, one of the first things is going to be what's the character overlap, right? Because maybe we need to tweak this character a little bit to separate them from people who already represent a similar world look, uh, world out view, can't even say it, who represent a similar outlook, worldview. <laughs> there we go. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a a specific thing they need to do in this story. And that's a reason that you're changing their personality a little bit because you have an idea of where they're going to grow to. So you might start them at a different point than maybe where we've seen them. So I think, yeah, basically the first thing you're thinking about is who is this character in this show? What's their art going to be? What purpose do they serve? And how do we want them to interact with the other characters? Maybe you imbue them with something that causes another character to react negatively toward them because you want to have you know, a source of conflict that, that didn't exist in their previous incarnations. So yeah, it's really about servicing the story, I think, and seeing what the most satisfying combination of characters is going to be. It's like Image has Beast Boy who shows up with a largely different origin that works so well because of how it fits into this world and fits into all of these other characters. So I think that's the that's the one that springs to mind for a lot of people when looking at like, oh, Beast Boy's completely different and yet perfect <laughs> for who he's supposed to be. <laughs> that's great. That's really great. Yeah. And it's really nice to be able to do kind of just these, I don't know, alternate takes on origin stories or why characters are the way they are. This is why it always feels like when you're working in a DC property that it's this greater myth, right? Because there are many versions of the stories of Hercules and what he did and who he's doing what to now. Um, and so this kind of feels like that same space where these things can all be simultaneously true and also tailored to the story you want to tell. Absolutely. It's the thing that me and Rich talk a lot about that is the idea of there is a heart to this character that has to exist in every version of it for it to feel true and mm -hmm. everything else around it can change or be altered to fit a new setting or a new time as long as that heart is still there. It doesn't matter if Robin is the leader of the team as long as Robin still feels like Robin kind of thing. Definitely. So... Thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Nicole. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am most active on Twitter, and it's just Nicole Dubuque on Twitter. Easy to find. So yeah, that's really my presence out there. I do have a website that is woefully neglected and needs to be updated. <laughs> but that's NicoleDubuque.com. So thank you for having me this is so great i i love the podcast of course i always love talking about this show because it's a it's a really special one oh genuinely thank you so much for being on we are so we were so excited when you said you would come on and this has been so amazing
Thank you to everyone listening for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if somehow that isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. And if you're able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, reviews, and so much more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.